Public uh, Association for Computer Machinery. Um, it's part of the KDD. Uh, so we set up the CKDD charter in Singapore uh, to have uh, um, to foster and, and, and promote the development of data science, uh, and, and, uh, and particularly with the view of the uh, contribution towards the smart nation, uh, smart nation efforts. Uh, currently. Today we have uh, myself, uh, my name is uh, Giuseppe, I work uh, in Singapore in the uh, kind of data science uh, field. Uh, we have Aloysius, we have Dr. Uh, Ying Li, and we have Professor Hadi, which will be uh, conducting the session today. Um, we have a small announcement to make also, that uh, uh, hopefully everybody will uh, uh, take with uh, positive that the conference actually, the KDD conference will come to Singapore um, relatively soon, and maybe 2021, and um, uh, so we want to align a couple of activities to, uh, you know, get people and get um, some, uh, you know, uh, events and some uh, good uh, uh, traction to, to, to get to that date. Um, today we'll have our second uh, tutorial, which is uh, um, around image classification. It will be conducted by uh, Professor Hadi and uh, uh, one. So Professor Hadi, uh, you, know, you might know him uh, quite well as uh, uh, assistant professor here at SMU on uh, uh, the, um, particularly on the preferred AI uh, research project around the um, uh, machine uh, in, uh, learning and um, uh, focusing particularly on uh, recommender systems. Um, he <coughs> comes to S SMU after uh, working to uh, A Star and uh, coming from uh, Silicon Valley, where he was working with uh, Microsoft, and uh, he got his PhD from NTU in collaboration with A Star. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Professor Hadi and uh, for this morning tutorial. All right. So uh, thanks everyone for coming to the tutorial. Uh, I think here we look at this as a community effort. I think uh, we think that some of you probably even come here already knowing to do some stuff. Uh, some of you are beginners uh, because this is a public setting, so you know. So there's going to be some variance in terms of what people want to learn. And uh, so you know. So, so on the on the one hand, uh, feel free to contribute. This is a community, and if you see that some of the others are, are needing help and explanations, you can also contribute as well. Now, we are going to pitch this at a level of uh, where we are going to talk about the concepts. We're going to talk about uh, the tools and some of the codes that actually do this. So whether we want to take it uh, lighter, deeper, I think it depends on, on the audience. I think it depends on where you want to take it. If, if you think that this is, OK, we need to discuss something deeper, then we can always have that kind of a question and answers kind of a thing. But let's, let's get started. Now, the, uh, Giuseppe did mention uh, this project of Prepared AI. I just want to give a brief overview. Uh, and to put this whole thing in context, in terms of what we do. <coughs> so this uh, prefer.ai project essentially is a research project. Uh, that we are doing here in SMU. And a lot of the members of the group are actually here to help us, the uh, TAs as well. Uh, you can just raise your hands. Right. So, if at any point of time you have any questions, just uh, you know, let us know, and we'll come uh, to you. So, the, the point of the project is to learn uh, user preferences, and because we look at uh, the context of many e-commerce sites uh, nowadays, uh, that a lot of times we are given a lot of options, and we want to be able to narrow down to the most important options. Uh, this requires uh, a lot of uh, things to be researched uh, from end to end. And this notion of end-to-end -end recommendation framework comes directly from data and the idea that when we want to learn preferences, we have to learn it from data. And this data comes from user behaviors and actions. Now, we want to be able to personalize it. And the reality is that you know, to personalize something to you, which is a unique person, uh, we might have to rely on other people who are similar to you. And so that is the case that we're trying to build this uh, knowledge base that becomes a building block of this preference learning which is going to fit to the preference learning algorithms, uh, which means that this is going to take the data and try to build algorithms on top of them. And in, eventually, we want to make it available to the community uh, in terms of academia, industry, to, to share these things. And finally, once we have these algorithms, we need to deploy them into real applications. 
and there needs to be some way of surfacing these recommendations based on user queries. And this is going to be uh, requiring a uh, retrieval engine that essentially takes a query and be able to present these recommendations in real time. Now, uh, we are looking at this, and in terms of how do we realize this in terms of the way that people express preferences in many different ways. So people do this in terms of they use their right, so they write text and they tell you what they like, what they dislike. Uh, they also express their preferences of images, right? So they take pictures, they post on Instagrams. Uh, as well as they join social media, they join social networks, and they, uh, they basically become friends with people and you, you know what communities they belong to. Now this, today, we're going to talk about image classification. And part of the uh, context of this is that we are doing a lot of research in terms of learning user preferences of images. Now, which brings me to uh, where we are today. Uh, which is the tutorial on image classification. And we're going to focus on convolutional neural networks. This is one of the machine learning algorithms uh, that has shown especially good performance in image data. And this is part of the concept that we're going to try to learn. Like, why is it that uh, convolutions or the idea of trying to learn from the neighborhood or the pixels will actually help us? Now, I would also like to introduce Tuan, right? So, uh, Tuan here is a PhD student at uh, SMU. Uh, he's been working uh, intensively for the past two years on uh, machine learning, especially involving images. So he's an expert in this uh, topic, so uh, I'm happy to, to be doing this uh, together with him. Now, this is going to be the outline of today's uh, talk. Now, how far we go uh, depends on all of us. Okay, So uh, we don't necessarily expect to cover everything. I think it's more important that we get to each step and we get the concepts um, solidly, then, then we can then move on to the next one. But the basic idea is that first is the, I'm going to introduce a broad image classification. Why is it useful? Uh, then there are two applications that we are going to be targeting. Uh, one is uh, facial expression recognition. The idea of uh, taking a picture of a person and can we tell what is going to be his facial expression? Is he happy? Is he angry? Is he sad? Is he uh, surprised? And that is going to require a few uh, different models. Uh, we are going to start from the very basic model that we call multi-layer perceptron. And then we're going to go on to two other models, which is going to be variations of the convolutional neural networks. Now, uh, if we can get through at least part one, then I think uh, we have done a lot. Uh, now, if we can, if we have the time, then we'll go on to the part two, which is actually on uh, visual sentiment analysis. And this is the idea of if you take a picture, uh, a photographer take a picture and they put some meaning into the picture from the way that you do this, uh, we can try to tell what kind of sentiment are you expressing through the images that you, you take. And that's like positive, negative sentiment. Uh, we're going to be looking at data that comes from online reviews. Uh, this is the case where people review some restaurants and they are happy, they are not happy. And we try to see whether based on the images they post inside the reviews, whether we can tell whether they're happy or not. All right? Now, uh, OK. So let's get started with the notion of image classification. Uh, the problem is very simple. So you have an image, and you want to classify. So what does it mean to classify? It means that we have some categories that are important to us, and this is what we are trying to tell. Now, for example, one possibility is to detect some object within an image. So let's say we give you an image of a cat. Uh, in, well, in this case, it's a cat, right? But if you give it to a computer, uh, would it actually be able to tell whether this is a cat or a dog, for example? Now, it doesn't have to be just a cat or a dog. There could be many, many different possible objects. And this kind of problem is useful in terms of detecting what object appears within an image. So you can think of many possible applications, right? So we can think like it could be a part of some video surveillance system where you see that some video cameras are uh, tracking what people are doing uh, and see what are the objects that actually may appear, whether some of them are suspicious or not. Uh, in, in the past, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, work that has been done in research in terms of object recognition. Uh, now, this is the kind of cases where you will see a lot of photos. Can we actually see this? This is part of the notion of artificial intelligence, having robots uh, with vision who can recognize objects so they know how to interact with them. Uh, because if they know that it's a bird, it, it knows that they can fly, but first of all, it needs to be able to see 
uh, what a verb is like. Uh, this would also apply to things, for example, um, handwritten digits. So if you think about the way that we scan a document and automatically identifying what the document is saying, uh, that requires an ability to look at the image and identify if it's, is it a letter, is it a number, if it is a letter, what letter it is, if it is a number, what number it is, and this is going to allow the machine essentially to read from documents just by looking at these kind of images. Now, the facial expression recognition, this is something that I mentioned earlier. And this is essentially what we are going to be doing for most of the tutorial today. Now, there are a lot of applications for this, because a lot of, uh, it turns out that face is important in many different ways, right? I mean, nowadays, if you have an iPhone X, you, you will see your face, and you will be able to unlock. Uh, in, in China now, they have a system for uh, detecting faces that you can even pay with your face. Uh, because it's actually some form of biometric. Uh, so there's a lot of things here that you can do in terms of images that would actually be useful. Now, visual sentiment analysis, this is a different way of looking at things. In this case, we give you an image. We ask you, is it a positive image or is it a negative image? Now, depending on the person who is taking the picture, it may actually have different meanings. In this particular case, this is like a little kid uh, drinking a bowl of soup. So we think that this is probably positive but it requires the machine, some ability to do that. Now, the notion of positive and negative uh, oftentimes are very confusing, even for machines to learn. Uh, because in some sense, what the machine is trying to do is to look at what kind of image it is, what kind of patterns it has, and then it will detect whether it's positive or negative. Now, if we see a lot of faces, sometimes it can mean it's positive, because these are like group pictures. Uh, sometimes it could mean that it's negative, because it could mean like there's a long line or a long queue at the place. Now, when we do this image classification, uh, eventually, when you go into the literature or you go online, you're going to come across some of these terms. So we just want to introduce this briefly, so, so you just get a sense of what uh, learning means. So uh, firstly, there is a notion of supervised or unsupervised learning. Uh, this is a way to differentiate between whether or not supervised, meaning like you have a teacher who tells you whether you get it right or wrong. So in this case, if I ask you to classify images, and then I'll tell you what the correct label is. Like, is it a cat or is it a dog? And you say, this is a cat, no, that is a dog. So in that case, there is a degree of supervision that comes from the labels. They will help you to correct the learning. Now, unsupervised is a different kind of learning where we don't tell you what the labels are. So in some sense, there is no teacher. So we just give you a bunch of photos. And then when you look at them, you look at there are a lot of cats, there are a lot of dogs, right? Even without knowing beforehand what they are, you can more or less group together all these different pictures of cats, all these different pictures of dogs, because there is some similarity uh, between these animals. So both types are useful. Uh, today we're going to talk about supervised learning, uh, the kind that we're going to give you the labels, and we're going to learn from that. Now, when we try to do classification, uh, again, there are different types of classification. Uh, the most basic one is what we call binary. Binary means there are only two classes. So most of the time it's a yes or no, positive or negative. Is it a cat or is it not a cat? Uh, is it a dog or is it not a dog? Now, this is the simplest kind, and if you can build a binary classifier, uh, essentially you can build on that to, to build other you know, more fancy classifiers. So multi-class is a generalization of binary where you may have more than two possible classes. So for example, you may have a lot of different types of objects and you want to identify uh, each one. Now, multi-label classification is something that is a bit different. Multilabel means that when we ask you to classify something, there can be many possible answers. So if I ask you, is this image is that of a cat, then you know if the answer is whether it's a cat or not, right? But in some cases, uh, within an image, there are actually multiple labels. You you can say that I want to label it by based on the object that it has. So this could be in terms of whether this is a car or or, or a cat and so on. We can also label it based on the idea that you know what what color is it, or whether there is a different object in it. And then it's considered multi-label because we are trying to attach multiple labels to the object. Now, to keep it simple, today we're going to do single label. That means uh, one image, one label. Uh, but the label can be one of two possibilities. Right? Now, the other concept uh, when we do learnings uh, is the idea of training data and test data. Uh, because this is something that soon enough you will come across uh, within the code. So the idea is the following. We try to learn. So now, if we give you 
Uh, it's like giving you a test, right? So if uh, you come to the classroom and we show you all the questions and then we discuss the questions one by one in during the exam, I cannot give you exactly the same question. Because in that case, what you will probably be doing is just to remember what you saw before and then just reproducing the same answer. So in that case, you're not really learning. So most of the time, what does the teacher do? The teacher will give you another set of questions which will not be the same as the ones that you did before. But it's not going to be totally different either. It's going to, to try to test you in terms of whether you can generalize the concept from before to after. So that's the basic idea. Training data, test data, meaning if you have a full data, so you have to split that. And when you split it uh, into training and testing, and the idea is that you learn from the training, and we're going to hold up the testing. You're not allowed to see the testing during the time when the model itself is learning. Now, well, after you have done the training, then we will test it by showing this test data, which is kind of like the exam. Now, uh, today we're going to do a 90 time split. So that means 100% uh, of the data we split into 90% for training, 10% uh, for testing. Now, you might come across some other settings where we call like a cross validation. The idea is that uh, maybe you, you know, if you test only upon a specific set, uh, maybe this is uh, too specific. It could be that we randomly just happen to pick the easy cases. So in some uh, way, scenarios, people may do what they call cross-validation. In this case, you divide the data into multiple pieces. And each time, you train with the rest and just test, test on that piece. So in this case, you can divide it into five pieces. So each time, you take four of them and train, and then test it on the remaining piece. Uh, but today, to keep it simple, we're just going to do a simple train test uh, split. <coughs> now, this is going to be the scope of the tutorial. Uh, much of it is going to be hands-on. So that means that uh, you know, we, we are talking here to, to set the stage. Uh, but later on, I think we're going to spend most of the time on actually working with the code, trying out different uh, variations of it, and hopefully learn some things along the way in terms of how these models actually work. Now, uh, for the setup, you want to talk a little bit about setup? I think, I think most of them have that. Yeah. Okay. So, but basically today, uh, we are going to use TensorFlow. There are many different frameworks to do machine learning. Uh, but because some of these models require an algorithm to learn the parameters, uh, you know, uh, in the past, a long time ago, I mean, uh, what we need to do is to look at each individual model, and then we need to get a specific code to learn for that specific model. Uh, but today, because of uh, the, a lot of work that has been done by the community, as well as some of the big companies, they have been doing this in terms of platforms and uh, frameworks that essentially will do a lot of the learning as long as we can design the model. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today, which is the model design. Because a lot of the learning can be done uh, by the framework. Now, uh, we are not going to go into the framework and, and explain the learning algorithms, but we're going to give you a sketch of how some of this learning uh, is actually being done. Now, for, uh, okay, this is, uh, I hope that most of you would have already done this. Uh, if you still have a problem, later on during the first hands-on session, we are going to uh, revisit this. So the first thing we're going to do is the facial expression recognition. Uh, but in this case, we are going to look at a simple model that is called multi-layer Cassandra. So this is a form of neural network. Now, firstly, I think, how many of you are familiar with neural networks? I think a lot of you are, actually, right? So I'm just going to give like a very brief introduction uh, here. Uh, but the basic idea is that uh, to do learning, you need to build a function. They will be able to take an input, in this case, like images, and it will produce an output, which in this case is a class. It could be a positive class, negative class, a cat or a dog, and so on. So that means when we talk about the input here, we are talking about the data itself, which is like an image. So what is the data from the image? It will be the pixels. And each pixel will have a certain color scheme, right? So and that becomes the input into the model. Now, this is a single neuron. Uh, essentially, you take the inputs and you combine the inputs through a function. Now, the function essentially is to get some parameters like w, 1, w, 2. These are just some real numbers. Then you multiply them to the inputs, and then it turns into a function that will output something. Now, a single neuron, when it outputs a value, which is output here, is essentially a combination of the input. 
but we are making a difference in terms of which input is more important. So if W1 is higher, then it's more important. If W2 is higher, then w the second input is more important. So you can imagine the inputs here could actually be the different pixel locations. So it could mean that if I'm looking at a face, then we try to determine what is the sentiment. Uh, it could be that maybe we need to be looking at the eyes, or we need to be looking at the mouth. And this is the different kind of uh, pixel locations that we are paying attention to. Now, the, there is a concept of activation function, because this is also part of the code that you're going to see later. When you look at the output, the output here is some linear combination, which means that the value can be anything. And most of the time, because we're going to recombine this in many different ways, we try to map it to some uh, range that, uh, that is uh, more well-behaved, in the sense that we can combine them because they, they are more or less about the same. Now, if the sigmoid is a function that will transform any value into a range from 0 to 1. So it means that based on the earlier function, it could be 1,000, but then it would just be transformed into 1. Now, another function is called tank function. It's going to transform it from minus 1 to 1. And there is uh, another function, which is ReLU, uh, which essentially just removes the negative values. Uh, you just keep the positive uh, values. Now, these are different <coughs> options. That means that later on, you can try within your model uh, what are the different options that you, you whether some actually may perform better than another one. Now, the concept of a neural network, essentially, is just a combination of the neurons. So these are the inputs. This is a layer. Now, the hidden layer here, it means that these are the layer that is the model. This is the one that actually learns from the input in order to produce the output. So here we introduce two neurons, and plus one, which is called bias. And bias is there to help us to uh, take into account uh, certain uh, factors, like for example, there's some imbalance in the classes, whether one class is more likely than another, uh, or and other factors like that. Um, now, this is basically data-specific things, which is very dependent on the input. Now, the number of neurons that you put within the layer is part of the model. So in, in theory, if you put in more and more neurons, uh, you're making the model more and more complex. It can learn more things. So this is like hopefully like, you know, when people say in the brain you have a lot of more neurons, you become more intelligent, you can see more things. Uh, but it's possible also that at some point you overthink things, right? That it's like a, you, you read things that are not there. Right? That there's a concept that if you have to too complex a model to learn from, too simple a data, then you may be what we call overfitting. Like uh, this is learning things that are actually not there. Uh, just because you know a lot of imagination uh, take place. Uh, now, there are a few parameters that we need to take into account, like how many neurons we want to use. Now, there could also be more than one layer. So this is one layer, but you can introduce a second one, a third one, a fourth one. And that is part of the model design that we need to play with. Now, when we say something is single layer perceptron, it means that there's only input and output. Uh, this is a very, very simple model. Uh, most of the time, we can't learn much with it. Now, when we say multi-layer perceptron, it means that this number of hidden layers, they could be one, they could be two, they could be three. And this is essentially what we're going to be dealing with uh, today. Right? Now, uh, without further ado, right? So what we're going to do uh, is to look at some cases. now. OK, so how to train your network, yeah. So uh, here is just a sketch, right? I mean, the, the idea here is that we say that there are some weights. Uh, these weights are the ones that are going to make up the model. So now, how do they learn these weights? They need to learn these weights, we say supervised, right? So we need to give it a label. So it means that essentially it's going to go through a process of that we call a backpropagation. So you can start from random weights. Like your weights can initially be random. Uh, it doesn't have to be meaning anything. Then you take one image, you put it in through this network, and then it's going to give you some output. Now the output, because it's a random weight, it could well be random. Uh, but when the output is there, it becomes a guess onto the class, which is whether it's a cat or a dog. Then we compare it to the real label. When we compare it to the real label, then we will know whether it is correct or it is wrong. Now, if it is correct, then we will reinforce the weight. If it is wrong, then we will tell them to reduce the weight in a direction that will make it correct. Uh, that direction is something that is called a gradient. So essentially, you start from random weights, and then in the forward propagation, you put in the inputs through all the way to produce the output, and then you look at how much error you are making. Error here means that out of the guess that you are making by the model, uh, compared to the label and whether it's the same or not. 
If it is not, that means that uh, there is an error. Then we look at a gradient, uh, and then we're going to update the weights based on this gradient. And then we're going to do this back and forth thing for many, many, many times until the adjustment, uh, little by little, is going to bring the model closer and closer to the final uh, model that you have. So, so later on, you, when you run your code, you will see a lot of iterations. Uh, that, that is the concept of that the, the model is actually doing back and forth in terms of learning. Okay. Now, we are going to start with the first hands-on exercise, which is based on this uh, facial expression recognition. Now, the data are actually public. This is part of an earlier Kaggle competition. Uh, each uh, e uh, each uh, data is going to be a 48 by 48 pixel grayscale image. And originally, there are going to be seven classes. Now, we, you, you could build, and in fact, as a homework, you might want to build a classifier that can uh, do this uh, seven different classes. But for the classroom uh, session, we're just going to do two classes, which is happy and sad. And we have prepared the data uh, for you in terms of equal number of happy images and sad images. Uh, there is training, there is a testing. Training means that this is what we're going to learn from. This is going to be what is we're going to be testing on. And, and later on, we will even allow you to try to test it with your own images. That means that you can even take a picture and see whether the model that, uh, that you build actually detect things uh, correctly. Alright, so then let me invite uh, to, to, to get us started onto the hands on uh, session. You have to see the page, right? this part, the prerequisite, so please raise your hand and the TA can come and help you with this part. So I saw most of you are already installed the um, Python environment, clone the repository, and install the required packages. So we start with the first uh, tutorial, which is uh, with the data set that we already introduced, the facial expression recognition. So first you need to download the data set. So I already provide the script to download the data set, which is uh, uh, show here. So basically, we are inside the um, tutorials uh, directory. We go inside the uh, this folder, the uh, image classification uh, folder. Then we run the uh, we go inside the face emotion, which is the folder for the first tutorial. Then we're gonna run the um, script to download the data set. Which is this flag command. This one will be on the road. Just uh, download the data set with this 
script. Uh, for Windows, uh, if you cannot run the script, then I provide a link to directly download the dataset, which is a zip file. So you download it and then you uh, unzip it and then move it to inside the phase motion folder. So 
as you can see, the first layer we have the input things. So our input is the uh, each uh, data is uh, one image, right? Forty-eight by forty-eight, and uh, one is a uh, uh, channel, which is uh, this one is grayscale. So we only have one uh, channel of color. For the less, uh, RGB, we have three channels. So this one has one. Uh, the first layer both we uh, flatten it out, which is we flatten the whole image at uh, one long vectors, because the neural network, uh, the um, MLP model, they they see the they uh, receive an input in the form of a vector. So we vectorize the whole image to a long uh, vector. And uh, so this uh, meaning of the first layer, uh, as you can see here, they uh, uh, flatten out the images to this vector. And uh, the second layer board, we, so okay, to make it a little bit clear, this one is still uh, kind of a high level API tensor flow. And uh, it's the, so, you guys may come across the Keras uh, framework, right? Which is uh, a higher level API for TensorFlow. And uh, so this one is the tensor layer, um, uh, TensorFlow uh, layers, uh, uh, another package which is high level API. So I give you this uh, kind of uh, uh, API to uh, get used to it first. Then we can uh, uh, go through into its uh, detail later because um, this one, we, uh, if we define uh, in very details, we can interact with the weight and we can modify it. Uh, Easier. So for this live code, we define an, a fully connected layer, which is have the uh, receive the input x, and uh, the x here is a vector that we already vectorized from the first, uh, the previous uh, live code. And this one will receive x and uh, fit through another layer, which is the output 128 uh, neurons. The layer, the next layer, gonna have, uh, then we're gonna have uh, 128 neurons, and we use the Activation function, which is a ReLU function, that's uh, I already mentioned before. So this uh, uh, non-linearity uh, activation function. So it's going to be summarized here, which we take that into X, we divide by the weight matrix here by us, and then we apply the ReLU function. So after the first fully connected layer, we apply the top out layer. So dropout is uh, one technique that uh, generally apply for the neural networks to avoid the overfitting, uh, to help avoid the overfitting of the model, which is the model is uh, not too complex. So dropout, uh, so the basic idea of dropout is that you, it take in some uh, probability. So how many percent of neurons that you want to drop? So this one we receive, uh, we, we define uh, uh, 50 percent uh, uh, dropping probability. So uh, let's say this layer, right? We have, we have six neurons, so we drop uh, 50%, which is three neurons. So uh, one way to think about dropout is like, uh, if you guys come across the notion of uh, example learning, which is the kind of uh, example multiple classifier, which is for some traditional machine learning models. So dropout, uh, for each time, is going to drop uh, some random neurons, which is by the time you basically you run multiple models and you ensemble it inside uh, this one model, so uh, that is uh, how dropout works. And uh, we define the dropout layer between the uh, the first fully connected layer and the, the second uh, fully connected layer because these two layers have uh, quite a lot of neurons. So we we don't want the model to overfit on our data, and we apply dropout. So. Basically, the next layer, we use the same API, right, which is a dense layer. And we define another 128 neurons. And then we go to the logic, which is the preparation of the model. So this is one way to look at the whole framework, the overview about how we look at the whole model and the training process. So uh, this one called computational graph which is the basic idea is uh, we define the whole process at the one graph. And most of the uh, deep learning libraries that we already introduced before based on this idea. And uh, the underlying principle more or less the same. And it's just uh, they are different in the way that they uh, deal with the graph. And so basic, basically the graph we can view is that we have input x and the uh, Label Y that we're going to fit in for each iteration. So it's going to be changed for each iteration. So we fit in new data. Uh, the model here is the inference architecture, which is 
uh, for the let's say the MLP model here, we already defined here. So most of the uh, model component, which is all the model parameters that we want to learn, uh, lie in this block. And after we have input, we do the inference, and we have the prediction about the model. And then we want to compare with the ground truth label that we had at the beginning. And uh, we can compute the loss. So let's say here we compute the um, cost entropy loss, which is between the uh, prediction and the uh, labels, the ground truth label. And then after we already have the loss, so we go to the optimization uh, process. And for those kind of framework, like TensorPro, PyTorch, or other uh, deep learning framework, they, they take care of it, which is the, uh, the idea here is that you take the loss, you compute the gradient, and then you apply the gradient to update the weight of the model that we already defined here. So uh, the advantages of using those uh, framework is that they automatically <coughs> compute the gradient based on the what they already defined in the model, and they help you update the weight efficiently. Uh, so that's the advantage of using those framework. So uh, we uh, provide some small exercise that, uh, for everyone to try it out. Like uh, uh, we already defined the default model, right? Which is uh, uh, 128 neurons. So uh, you guys can try with the um, different uh, with different number of neurons inside the model, just like uh, 64 or 32, and uh, uh, keep running and then uh, try, try to fill in this. Uh, Column, and then uh, we already have uh, another set of exercise that we we can try to uh, have a different number of layers. Like uh, we here we have two layers, right? We can remove one layer, or we can add more one more layer to see the effects of how uh, the, uh, the number of the neurons and number of layers have the model to obtain the different accuracies. Yeah. So I think most of people already try, right? Try to run with different settings that we have. So we uh, already run it, and uh, this is the result that we get. Uh, basically, uh, to be clear, the model is, um, as I mentioned, the neural network is uh, it's not convex function. So sometimes you train it, you're gonna get some local optimum, some local optimum, and some maybe better. So it's hard to adjust the model. So here we run the each, for each setting, we run five times, and we get average result. Then we can see uh, more relative, more accurate uh, performance as a model. So as you can see here, right, for 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 one layer, for one layer only, we if we increase the number of neurons which means that we increase the capacity of the model. We have more parameters. So then the model can learn better, which is perform better than the uh, smaller number of neurons here. Uh, when we increase to two layers, uh, with these settings, it's perform better than the setting of the one uh, layer, which is because uh, we have um, a little bit more complex uh, model and the uh, we have more uh, uh, nonlinearity transformation. <coughs> and, uh, the model generalizes uh, better the, all the data, uh, but the we, when we increase the uh, number of neurons here, when uh, we increase the, uh, 128, is the performance is a bit decreased. It's, it's not so much, but it's uh, performed uh, a little bit worse than 64 neurons, which is uh, at that point time we might. Uh, guess that the, the model is <coughs> a little bit old fit and uh, uh, we don't need that much of complexity to learn on the data set. And uh, for your information, the data set that we have some statistics at the beginning, we have uh, quite a small <coughs> number of images. So uh, that's not a lot, a lot of data for it that we uh, train. And uh, when we increase to three layers, the model is getting more complex and which means that it's harder to train, to optimize that function on the data set. So the best accuracy here is still 128 uh, neurons, but it's uh, much smaller than the two, two neurons with 64, uh, uh, two layers with 64 neurons. So uh, in some cases, we, we need to uh, know 
uh, what kind of data that we have and what is the statistics of data, then we may have some estimation of the uh, kind of model that we try to design. And sometimes it will uh, go uh, so uh, complex so that the model uh, is hard for the model to converge and it's hard to train the model. Uh, so anyone had uh, any questions about this part? Better, right? So I uh, just uh, explain that uh, we, we, we have some explanation. Actually, uh, even fire run, right? We, we cannot uh, conclude anything because uh, we didn't even need to run more like 10, 20 runs to uh, have the result and we may uh, do the static testing to really conclude that which one perform better than which one. So this one we just uh, run the fire time and to, to see the relative results. Uh, but it seems to be that uh, this kind of data set that uh, uh, relatively small, then we don't need that much uh, complexity to learn. And we go even higher, then it's harder to optimize. Uh, one guy over there uh, only tried with uh, two layers, but the the, um, the first layer, uh, one, right? one layer, right? So we only have one hidden layer, and the, the, the middle layer that only have one layer. And it can get even 72% of accuracy. So sometimes we don't need that much complexity of the model to change. Uh, that kind of model is still is still um, is still a neural network. It's, it's still uh, perform better than um, it's it have more capacity than the low speed regression because it's have one uh, hidden layer at the, at the middle and then it's have uh, nonlinearity transformation. So uh, and it's have a lot of set of parameters at the beginning because the, our input uh, vector is uh, very large. The size is 48 by 48. So, but if you use one layer, it doesn't generalize well, even though you can see the accuracy, but if you use more layers. But if you use one layer, there will be overfitting. One layer will be overfitting. Yeah. Uh, I'm not like, sure. Like when we try with one layer, yeah. the training accuracy is higher than the test accuracy. If you train with higher layer, um, with more layers, then you have uh, better accuracy. Uh, it generalized better. It generalized better. Uh, I would say that it has uh, higher capacity. So I mean, it's, uh, it's, it can learn a more complex function. But I'm not sure it's generalized better than this data set because sometimes you uh, get off it and it's harder to optimize because you have more parameters. The model or the, the, the function is more complex. And then sometimes you're going to, uh, because you have more constraint, right? you optimize more uh, parameters. and uh, uh, it's, it's just that you have more capacity. You can approximate a more complex function, but it doesn't mean that you're going to learn better the function for this kind of set. So for the other data set, maybe you need more complex function. For this one, you just need that much of capacity to approximate. So maybe you go higher. You can you, for this particular type of model, you might not uh, perform better than like 75, 76. Even you add more and more layers. So you can try it out later, like add four or five layers and try different settings. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, how do you measure if a model is uh, appropriate or not? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So that is the basic problem of the uh, when we train the machine learning model, right? So uh, normally to detect its own fit or not, we have another uh, development set. So uh, we, besides train and test, right, we have a uh, different set. So during the training, we're going to, uh, let's say, after one epoch, let's say, so we're going to test the model on the um, development set. So you're going to see the accuracy. So at the beginning, uh, you can see the loss, or you can manage the loss or the accuracy. So at the beginning, it's going to decrease, uh, it's, uh, the accuracy is going to increase uh, as uh, you see with the training accuracy. But at some point, the accuracy uh, in the training set keep increasing, but the development set keep decreasing. Decrease. So at that point of time, the model get overfit on the training data because it doesn't generalize on the uh, development set. And then you're gonna see the same effect with when you don't test the model on the test. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the uh, that is the idea to keep track when the model is overfit. So. Uh, okay, uh, following with this question, so in uh, when training with neural network, people uh, normally apply the early stopping technique, which is you hold out a different set, and then whenever you see the model get the overfit, which is the accuracy in the, the uh, different set, uh, keeps decrease, then you stop the model there. You save that 
point, which is you, uh, which means that you, you, you assume that this point pump, the model at that time, generalize uh, the best on the whole uh, data set we have. Got it. So, uh, okay, so it's the first. With the number of neurons and the number of layers, do you see any patterns emerging <coughs> in a particular data set? So you can predict what a, an outcome might be with a certain number of neurons and a certain number of layers. I'm sorry, I heard. So could you generalize the number of neurons and the number of layers? Can you generalize the number of layers? Can you predict the outcome? Can you predict the outcome? If you were to go 32, 33, 34 neurons per layer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 layers, you would have a whole data set. Is there a trend? Yeah, the trend in the performance depending on the number of neurons. Trend, yeah. Is it always increasing? Is it decreasing? You see the middle one there going up and down. Ah, oh, actually, it's not a trend. It just happened that way before this uh, setting. So, uh, as I discovered, I, I, it's not really a pattern. Like you, you see this pattern, right? Uh, that I'm not sure actually, but uh, it just happened that way in this uh, particular case. But you can see, like uh, all these two numbers, right? It's not really much different. And, for that one, we only run a fire run, so we cannot conclude anything. We just have to really take it down. Uh, it's, it's better than you do it one time, then you're going to fall into some logo thing that we cannot uh, tell that it's one of the fall between the worst or what. So we average, so we can see the result. But it's happened that uh, uh, it's happened that uh, for this one, we cannot conclude anything. Uh, it's not really a pattern. Uh, and that one, we only run a fire run, so we cannot conclude anything. Just have to really take it down. So we can see the result. Kind of uh, good for this model. That's why we said that we found one with uh, two layers with uh, 128 neurons for this uh, particular model. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about the dropout? Uh, so, sorry? The dropout layer? Dropout layer? Yeah, how does that fit this picture? Like, how does it help us? How does it help us? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, have you tried to remove the dropout? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Uh, so I, I said, right, sometimes this, um, so dropout is a kind of good uh, technique that when you have uh, more neurons, right, you, when you see the model is a little bit complex and you see that uh, it's one way to reduce, uh, one way is you can reduce the number of neurons, right, one way you can increase the probabilities of dropout. If you have enough uh, computational, uh, computational resources to gain on that big data, you can, uh, put the dropout in, and then you can uh, increase the uh, quality of the dropout, which means that you, I want to change uh, this model on the set with the different, uh, uh, many smaller models, and then later combine. Like for example, let me make um, effects. So it sounds like it makes the model more robust, because you're basically asking the model not to rely on all the signals all the time. Okay. It's so like sometimes some connections are present, right. some of the time, yes. and some yes. others are So then what you say is that then you can simulate the scenario as if you see many smaller oh, okay. uh, places. Like so, so then we, it will help the model overfit to, to be able to generalize better. Okay. So but when we do the prediction also, <coughs> is the dropout layer, like for which? which like, we had the number of smaller models. Uh, so no, when we one? do the prediction, we don't drop, we use all the features. Uh, so basically, uh, let's say the concrete uh, example that we do the phase uh, expression uh, the condition, we do the phase. And then, for example, we apply drop out. Uh, we can imagine that uh, so when we do a training, right, sometimes mm -hmm. it drop, maybe it's drop some part of the phase. Uh -huh. Then it's ask the model to do, it's actually it's hard to pass, right? You mask some parts of the phase, let's say. And then you still ask the model to to generalize on this only part of the, the, the phase. And then later when you do testing, you provide uh, all the information. So uh, uh, basically, you ask the model different uh, part of the model and different part of the features. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's the MLP model. So we, we see that uh, it uh, achieves uh, some certain level of accuracy, right? But uh, 
and we may try later that it cannot uh, go for better than that uh, level because uh, this when we increase the, the complexity of the model, we, it's harder to optimize. I've already discussed. So we today we that's the main part that we're going to focus today, which is the uh, convolutional neural networks model, which is the model that try to overcome the, uh, the drawbacks of the uh, MLP models. And uh, ah, so, okay. so, yeah, so, so how are you going to discuss? Tell you something about right. it. Uh, I think here we are trying to improve upon this. And so I think the basic idea is that how do we design a model that can capture some additional signals, some additional features that the original neural network might not have captured. And I think the basic intuition, uh, first of all, is the idea that when we look at images, right, uh, there is some information in the way that the pixels are laid out. So initially, when we train the MLP, every pixel is its own input. So, and we just need to know that at particular position, what is the color in that uh, pixel? Now, that uh, is actually learning pixel by pixel, but if you think about the way that an image is, right, if I give you an image and I randomize the pixels, now, the set of pixels are still the same. It's just that they're in different locations, right? Now, can you still tell what the image is? It becomes very hard, right? So it means that there's a lot of information in the way that the pixels are located nearby one another, and that's actually where a lot of information is. So now the thinking then is that how can we devise a neural network structure that can take advantage of this locality of information within images? Uh, so that's the idea of a convolutional neural network. Now, if you now this is a very intimidating picture, but essentially it's made up of some simple concepts. Uh, the concept is the following: so you, you get an image, right? So in this case, uh, we are going to look at the image not one pixel at a time. Uh, but we're going to take a look at one window at a time. Now, what is that going to allow us to do? It's going to allow us to not just see one pixel, but essentially imagine some basic shapes emerging from the images. So, for example, if you take a look at this one, right? So this is like such an image of a car. If you take one window, you probably can guess, right, what's going to be the shape there. And that is, uh, is going to uh, have some sense of what kind of object might actually be inside there. Now, these different things essentially are the same as just the number of layers that we learned earlier. So this is like uh, layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, and so on. Now, the original neural network it looks like this. So this is what we trained the MLP just now. We got it fully connected. So every input, uh, every layer, every neuron here is connected to everything that came before it. Now, the convolutional layer is something that's going to be different. And the key difference is that if we take any layer or any neuron inside here, it's not going to be connected to everything, it's only going to be connected to a subset of the neurons that capture a particular window. Now how is it doing that? Now you can look at this in the, the convolutional operation, the convolution operation. This, imagine this is an image, right? So the 5 by 5 uh, pixel image. So in our case, like uh, this is 48 by 48. Now we are going to take a, a set of neurons uh, one window at a time. So in this case, we have a filter, uh, but the filter doesn't capture all the image at the same time. It only captures a subset, which in this case is 3x3. Three three. So this 3x3 three three filter, we are going to scan it across the image. So now in this case, we take this 3x3. Three three. If you look at this animation, it will begin with when the filter is actually here. So it's going to multiply with the inputs, and then it's going to ag be aggregated into one cell here. Now, what it means is that now when you look at this cell, this doesn't come from a single pixel, it comes from nine pixels, a three by three region. So it, it tries to capture what actually exists within that region. Now, if you look at this, it means if you look, a, look at an image, three by three pixels, what can you see? You may start to see some basic shapes going on. It could be like a curve, it could be like a line, it could be like uh, maybe a black dot and so on. Now, but the beauty of it is that because we maintain multiple layers, uh, these basic shapes that we learn across the multiple layers are going to be built on top of one another. So then we will, by the end of the layers, we may start to see, we may be able to detect some more complex abstractions, like uh, certain shapes emerging. And that is essentially what's going to help this notion of convolution uh, deal better with image data. 
Now, uh, the second thing uh, is the idea of pulling. So there is this particular concept as well. Now, if you look at an image, right, uh, your image may be 10 megapixel, but in the past, when our camera is only 1 megapixel, it still pretty much takes an image that you can understand. Uh, even if you go back beyond that, and even with the last pixel, we can still understand. So it means that a lot of the information that is within images, uh, you don't actually need all the pixels all the time. Uh, in fact, you can develop abstractions that will reduce it to some lower dimensional uh, image that will still be useful. So pooling <coughs> is, uh, in a way, it, it is useful in a few different ways. One is that it reduces the dimensionality of the image. What it does is that uh, it actually gives us a better representation because most of the time what we try to capture is an abstraction. What kind of object it is, what kind of color it is. Now the second thing it does as well is that it reduces the number of parameters. So in, in that sense, it, it compresses the image. So in this case, we have a four by four. By pooling, what it means is that we take a region, let's say two by two, and then we pull them together. We kind of think that, okay, this whole thing actually codes for a single pixel, which is like this. In this case, we take a maximum, which is a six. Now, if you look at this image, right, this is essentially a lower dimensional representation, but it still captures most of what is happening within the bigger image. So I said, those, those are the ideas. Uh, one is the notion that image is spatial, two-dimensional, so you want to pay attention to the neighboring pixels. And the second thing is uh, to develop a better sense of the image when we do this pooling, which reduces the dimension of the model. Uh, so now, we are going to get back to the next uh, model. So there are going to be two models that we're going to be looking at. One is what we call shallow. Shallow is actually you only have a single layer of convolution. Uh, and later on, uh, we will see how we can go to deep layer, which means that we're going to add the convolutions uh, later on. So for this one, I think we're going to start with the shallow uh, yes. session, right? So you can do pretty much what we were doing earlier, but in this case, it's not MLP. Now we're going to have a shallow model. I think Tony's going to give a demonstration yes. uh, first. So we use implement. Instead of uh, we use MLP as a model name, right? We're going to use a shallow. You want to try it? Type it there. Okay. Yeah, they can't see it. Okay. So we need to get the. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here, right? Okay. We're going to give a single command. But now it's the uh, model is a shallow model. So it's going to take more time than before now. Yes. So this model requires more computation. So it take more time to train. Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, inside the NN5, the, the file that we define all the models, we also have the <coughs> model called shallow that I already defined here. And uh, the model can be defined as this really block, which is uh, we have input x, we have one commercial layer, we have one max poly layer, as we discussed, we have one dot out layer, and then we have one fully complete layer. And then so do the correction. So let's read it and then go through some like to discuss. So what we already discussed, right? About the commercial layer. And <coughs> some basic uh, some some uh, um, uh, parameters of the commercial layer that we might put attention. So first is the number of filters. So as the example that we showed there, right, is the one particular filter. So in this commercial layer, we use 32 filters. And basically, each filter is one small window. <coughs> each filter has their own set of width. Right. Uh, and we have 32, which is, uh, uh, and the size of windows here is 5 by 5. It's not 3 by 3, it's 5 by 5. So uh, the stride here is um, step, the jumping step of the um, of the, the, the uh, filters, which is one here, which means that you move each time you move uh, by one pixel. So you move one pixel, one pixel. Uh, the activation function followed by after the commercial layer is uh, a relu function, which is after you do the multiplication of the small windows, right? And then you summarize all, you aggregate all the values, and then you apply the relu 
uh, activation function after that. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the pattern here, there's a... Uh, okay, I need to explain a, bit, a little bit about the pattern. So we have uh, two type pattern. This one is the same pattern, which is... Uh, we want the... After we do the convolution, convol uh, convol uh, convolutional layer, after this one, we're gonna really, uh, we're gonna have the, another. Uh, we can call it another images, but we want it the size of the output images, the same as the input images. So we're gonna because if we only apply the conventional within this uh, uh, within this um, images, right, we're gonna reduce the size at some level, uh, like uh, depend on the size of the filters. But we want it to be the same, then we're gonna pat, pat the zero outside of the input images. Then we're gonna receive the output images at the same size of the input one. Uh, that's another type of padding called valid, which is you only do the convolutional. At some point you cannot do that, then you just uh, ignore the rest of the images. So this is another type of padding. Uh, any questions at this point now for this uh, layer? Okay, so I can move on. So we already discussed about the uh, pooling technique, and there are two types of pooling that we can apply. Uh, it's kind of two basic uh, pooling techniques that we can apply here. Is, uh, one is back pooling, and another one is average pooling, which is uh, we take max or we take mean of the windows. And uh, in practice, uh, max pooling uh, most of the time it performs better than the average pooling because uh, the characteristic of the images like uh, we. We, we try to focus on the uh, uh, attention on the some particular pixel that is uh, uh, immersed among, uh, among the rest of the pixel. So, max pooling, we always want to uh, figure out which part of the image is uh, brightest, it's more brighter than the other part. So, uh, yes, so here, the, this API, we can apply the max average pooling. We already can uh, use average pooling, they already provide the average pooling. So, you just take the input, you divide the pool side, which is the video side. So here we divide two by two, which is we, uh, uh, which basically is four images, uh, four, four pixels. Then we take the max value of this four pixel. And the stride two, which is uh, each time we move uh, the video side two, until then we, basically we reduce this uh, uh, quarter of the input size. So basically it's reduced a lot of uh, information. But it's also reduced the uh, dimensional, and then it's uh, it's very criti critical for this uh, image classification because basically the images we have a lot of pixels. Sometimes we, we don't really need all these pixels, and we uh, this technique help us to reduce the dimension. So yeah, we provide some small exercise. Uh, here we have uh, two exercises that uh, you can try it out. The first one is. Uh, you already run with the 32 filters, right? Now we can try with the 16 filters and uh, see the difference. And uh, another exercise that we can try it out with the size of the um, filters in the commercial layer. Just we can try here. The default is five by five. We can try with three by three and seven by seven to see. Uh, <coughs> the weights of the filters. Do we set them or are they the way of the weights for the filters? Uh, that is the. The way the filter is that the one uh, the, the, the way that we want to learn. So okay. yeah, at the beginning we random initialize it, and then uh, later on we're gonna learn uh, filter. We basically it's a filter, right? And then each particular filter gonna extract uh, some particular feature from the images. That's what we want to learn. So it's still the same as the neural network, which is it has a set of weights. These are the filters. Okay. So are there different ways of initializing? Sorry? Are there different ways of initializing the filters? Are they a way of initializing the filters? Uh, well, basically, it's uh, uh, you imagine the uh, neurons, right? So you initialize the neurons, and then it's rather initialized. There are uh, a lot of type of techniques to initialize the neurons, which is you can uh, uniformly initialize, or you can initialize based on Gaussian uh, distribution, or you can, uh, there's some technique uh, uh, you initialize based on the, uh, um, the, the norm of the, uh, the number of the neurons that you have. Then basically, the, those kind of techniques uh, try to avoid uh, the symmetric uh, initialization because it's going to uh, make the neuron dead, which you cannot learn from that neuron. <coughs> so, uh, 
that is the one uh, very um, active research topic, which is how to initialize the uniform. But uh, basically, uh, people use the uniform to initialize or initialize based on the Gaussian or the number of the So you, you do not initialize the uh, width too large. So normally, maybe you can initialize a uh, random uniform that's only initialized from minus 1 to 1. Say. Are, are, are there epochs you're making on, on, on each other or are they totally independent? Epochs. Epochs. Uh, epochs. Yes, definitely. Because uh, epochs, uh, the, the idea of epochs is uh, one time that you scan through all the things and you start from the beginning. And then you uh, okay. so that, that's totally relatively amazing. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, we already tried out, right, with the, this settings. And, uh, yes, uh, similarly, we try with uh, our, uh, we run it before, and then we run it five times, and we get average, and we compare results. So, as you can see here, uh, 32 filters perform a little bit better than uh, 16 filters. And uh, yes, again, the, the gap is not so big, so it's hard to uh, see. But uh, as you can see, right, the overall the performance of the shallow CNN much better than the uh, MLP model that we trained before, which can uh, approach like 76%. Uh, but here we can go to 80. Because of, uh, the only change is just we change the first. Uh, Fully collected by a commercial layer, then the result is there. Uh, when we try with different sizes of the filters, uh, we see that uh, the bigger size of the filter, we achieve higher accuracy. Um, so one explanation is that we increase the size of the filter, which is we increase the capacity of the model. Basically, we add more weight because we have a bigger size, right? We have more weight for these uh, filters, and even we have uh, the even we have the same size of filters, right? That we uh, we uh, also increase the, the capacity of the models. So this one performs better. But uh, in practice, uh, bigger size filters is not all the way better. Uh, in the sense that if we compare the two models with the same capacity, bigger size filter doesn't, does not all the way perform better. Because we can <coughs> stack small filters, hierarchically, like three filters, followed by three filters, followed by three filters. You can capture the original region, the same as the seven by seven filters, but you have smaller number, uh, uh, smaller numbers of uh, weight that we want to take. For, it, let's, uh, for example, this one, right? Seven by seven. Each filter, you need uh, 40, uh, 50 plus uh, because one bias. So you have 50, 50 weights for this size of the filters. But if three by three, then you only have ten, right? Three by three plus one is ten weight for each uh, filter. But you struck three filters, and then you need 30 width for these three filters. But it captures the same reason, and this benefits from the more abstraction the filter, uh, the, um, feature that you learn from. So uh, in practice, people avoid to use a, a very big um, size of filters. They use small size of filters, they uh, stack more layers, which is, uh, we're going to discuss more with the big uh, CNN model. That's the, the, the the main point that is like more commercial layer. Uh, so yes, the third part that we will discuss about the deep model. So the deep model is the, uh, based on the solar model. It's just uh, the building block is the commercial layer. Then we stack multiple commercial layers. And uh, here's the code for the uh, that we define the commercial. Uh, the, 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 um, we define the uh, deep CNN model and. We can build it course at this building block. So we have input x. We have one commercial layer followed by one max pooling layer. We have another block similar to this one, one commercial layer and then one pooling layer, and then followed by another block which is two commercial layer followed by one pooling layer, and so out and then fc. So even that have many more layers, but the number of parameters reduce a lot compared to the shallow model. Uh, I already showed the details uh, how to calculate the uh, number of parameters inside of me if uh, anyone interests. 
so basically, because of the pooling, we reduce the size later, later, and then uh, well, we reduce the dimensions of the data. Uh, but here, uh, we only use the three by three, the, um, five by five uh, filter size at the beginning. But later on, we only use three by three uh, for the following conventional layer. We don't need. Uh, we don't need a uh, big filter size because at that time we uh, the, our image is already reduced the, the size, so we don't need uh, big filter size there. And uh, but we increase the number of filters by the time we uh, uh, those uh, higher level abstraction abstraction because uh, the um, the intuition is that when we go with the higher level abstraction, we already capture a more <coughs> complex shape. So we need more filter particular filter to capture this particular shape. So that's why we increase the number of filters over time. Uh, so in the same, after that, we apply drop out and then we uh, we flatten out because at that point of time, right, it's still the uh, kind of image. So we need to flatten out and then apply drop out here and then one FC layer and then we go to the prediction. Uh, so yes, uh, another handle session, which is uh, a same as a shallow model now. Now we specify the model name as D minus minus model D. Yeah, so people can start to try with the CNN model. Yeah, it takes uh, a little bit more time than the shallow one because we need to do. Uh, need to do more positions sequentially, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like twice slower than the shallow one. Yes, so uh, it's gonna take time. So people uh, just run it, the code, uh, and uh, because after this one, we have the uh, some uh, real images that we have to try and. Uh, for the purpose of demo, we, we we create the we host the model that we already pre-trained on the website that you uh, so yes during the training uh, everyone can go to everyone can go to this uh, URL and try the pre-trained model that we already uh, deployed there. Uh, it's better if everyone can use the phone to go there and then take your own picture and try it, uh, your own emotions. Uh, it's only happy and sad. Okay. Yeah, it's only happy and sad. <laughs> So the uh, 
the score right next to the uh, class is the, the confidence score, the, the, the probability that the model predicts uh, these images to this class. So what happens? This one is okay. Is it happy or <laughs> deep inside happy?
So in this one, uh, I only show you some uh, basic visualization, visualization that we can think of. Like uh, we can visualize the activations of the model. So for example, these images, <coughs> they have the face. So here we visualize the, well, it's hard to see, right? Uh, yeah, actually it's a 128 uh, filters output from the filter of the, uh, the fourth commercial layer of the deep model. So we can see that it's kind of a lot of filters. Uh, focus on the uh, this part, the images. It's a rel relative position, but we can think about the model. A lot of filters that try to extract the feature from this part of the images uh, to make the images happy. Uh, for the set trace, uh, we can even see like one or two filters focus on this um, uh, position, but uh, other filters, it's, it's hard to see here on the slide, but you can see in the Image, uh, the photos I will show in the readme file. And then this uh, extract more about the other part of the face, which is the other part, uh, that uh, provides more features for the model to, to predict its uh, a set face. Another way to visualize, uh, it's kind of uh, a little bit advanced technique, which is uh, uh, visualize the um, salience map, which is uh, the technique called guided map propagation. So the idea is that you use the gradient to visualize. Basically, this one is a gradient. Uh, you fit in the images, you fit through the model to the end, and then you mask on the uh, negative gradient. You only back propagate the positive gradient. So the positive gradient tells that which part of the input feature is going to influence on the class. And by visualizing this uh, gradient, you're going to know that which uh, part, which until the input, you're going to see the gradient of the input, which is you're going to see that which pixel, which part of the images uh, influence on this class. Uh, by this, so you can see that uh, this part will influence uh, on the positive uh, class. Uh, this part, this part, this part, will influence more on the um, uh, negative, uh, uh, the, the um, set emotion. Uh, this part is like so we can uh, this there are two phase from the same class, the positive and the happy class. You can see that the more or less the, this part of the face uh, contribute uh, the most to the um, to what the prediction of the model. Uh, yeah, if uh, you want to more, I can you look at this uh, paper, which is the the work that they uh, contribute this technique. Uh, yes, and we already showed this one, right? Uh, then for the second part, uh, I think we have an outcome. So uh, yeah, let's see. So we, we don't have time to cover the second part, but the code is there. Uh, so I think we just introduced a problem, and I think you can explore it on your own. Uh, now this second part is a a, a bigger uh, model, so that means that this not, uh, this is not easy to train on your laptop. Uh, so but what we have done is that we have given you inside there a pre-trained model, so you can actually at least test it with uh, some real <coughs> images. But the basic idea of the visual subject analysis is to look at any image. Now, it doesn't have to be people faces. It can be anything. In fact, what we train on are images that we get from our restaurant reviews. Uh, so we go to Yelp and they got reviews and they take a lot of pictures about the restaurants and they express the ratings. So the ratings could be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 1 and 2 are considered negative, 4 and 5 are considered positive. And that becomes uh, the, 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 the training data. Uh, for example, right? So this is like uh, this is a restaurant in New York. So we see they have eight thousand reviews and seven thousand images. So I think increasingly, uh, a lot of these reviews actually have a lot of these photos. Uh, the model that uh, we use to this, um, okay. So uh, this uh, essentially is uh, it's quite deep. It has uh, five convolutional layers and is designed in two streams. Uh, this is reminiscent of the AlexNet uh, architecture. Uh, that comes from uh, the object detection uh, data set. Basically, the streaming in terms of the two streams uh, allows it to be parallelized across multiple GPUs. Now, uh, it turns out that for review <coughs> images, uh, or the reviews, uh, it reflects some subjectivity on the part of the people who got the reviews. So if we just train a model that applies to all the users, uh, they don't actually do as well. So then the idea here is to look into the concept of subjectivity uh, in the sense that we will then try to customize some part of the parameters to individual users. 
So the thinking is that uh, most of us share our evaluation of images most of the time, uh, but sometimes we may differ in terms of what we consider to be positive and negative. And that is actually done by uh, making some of these parameters in the final layers uh, to be specific to each user. And they require some changes in the way that we train the model to, to, to reflect this subjectivity in terms of the sentiment analysis. Uh, if you're interested more in terms of this uh, model, there is a paper that we wrote last year. Uh, so we are going to release the slides, I think, probably as part of the GitHub uh, page. So later on, you can uh, download this. So give it a try. And if you have any questions, of course, you are welcome to let us uh, know. Um, all right. So there are some key takeaways that we try to achieve today. Uh, one is the idea of image classification. We want you to to get familiar with it, to, to start thinking about what kind of applications you might uh, be able to put it to. Uh, now, one of the key concepts is why we talk about convolutional network uh, is exactly because when you talk about images, it has some spatial characteristics. Uh, now, this is specifically for images. We think of in terms of regions, right? But if you start thinking beyond images, even to other kinds of uh, data, for example, if you think about text, now text, uh, it will have some other nature, like sequential nature, that require a different kind of neural network structure. Uh, so this, this kind of uh, structures within the data can actually be used to further improve the learning models if you know how to exploit them. I think that's one of the things that uh, we want to take away. Now the third one is that when we try to get you to play around with these parameters to, to get to understand that you know, different uh, set of parameters may actually yield different models with different kind of performance accuracies. So I think this allows you to look at the trade-off. Because some complex models may, may be more accurate, but it will take longer than time. And at the same time, it will give you more complexity. More complexity could mean a good thing in some cases. It could also mean something negative in the, in the case that the model is too complex, the data is too simple, and the model cannot learn from a simple data, it starts to overfit. So, so there's all this trade-off that we need to manage when we deal with these uh, learning models. Now, uh, to end off, right, I mean, this is, uh, uh, well, in some sense, it's the first tutorial that we do as a group. Um, this is the second tutorial for CKDD, but this is the first tutorial for our own, uh, people that AI group. Uh, there are some tutorials that we are planning for the future. This is probably going to take place in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, one is the concept of uh, efficient retrieval for our recommendations. Just to introduce you, you know, a little bit of this idea. Think of it like, okay, if you go to Google, you search for a keyword, you get web pages, right? But when you type a keyword, and I type a keyword, we probably get the same set of pages, most of the time. Now, but if you think about recommendations, you go to some online uh, site like Amazon, uh, or you know, there are many, Lazada, and so on. Uh, ideally, if you type the same keyword as I do, we should both be getting different results, because you know what you want and what I want could be different. Now, but that creates a lot of complications in terms of the, the, the system that needs to be able to still return your results in, in real time because you're not going to wait five minutes, right? You want to get instant results, but then it has to be able to personalize at the same time. So this is uh, requires some challenges, and we're going to discuss like issues like how do we still allow the product search to be in real time and still be able to do personalization at the same time. Uh, there is another tutorial that we are also uh, will be doing. Uh, this is the idea of um, focus crawler for the deep web. The idea is that sometimes we need to collect data uh, from open sites, like uh, public sites, uh, and require some level of going deep into the site to, to, to do certain kind of queries so that we can collect uh, the data in a meaningful and systematic way. And we have developed an open source framework to do something like this. Uh, and this is another tutorial that we are uh, thinking of doing. Anyways, uh, if you're interested to, to follow what we do, uh, this is the, the website. And in fact, before you go, what we would like to request is uh, for you to give us some feedback uh, about to do today's tutorial as well, as well as some suggestions about what we could do for the future. Uh, this is, uh, so you can just go to this website. There is a simple Google form. Uh, we will appreciate it if you can do it before you leave. Uh, if you want to hang around a little bit to talk to us, we, we are happy to do that. And by the way, the, the, the food is still there. I mean, just in case some of you want to grab some bites before you go, uh, then, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and spending some time on a Saturday morning with us. Uh, I hope that it's been useful to you. Right? It's been. Yeah.
one high school or five high schools? Uh, five high uh, I see, yes, okay. All right, good. So I guess that's all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>